and we're live. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm not sure where, what time of day it is for where you're at, but it's morning for me. I got my, I got my coffee here. And um, we've got another amazing talk for you. We're kicking off a fresh new week. This is week three for BlockHack. And uh, we've got Akshay here, and he's going to talk about uh, blockchain in the ecosystem. Um, so this is super exciting. But as always, I like to get to know our speaker a little bit before we dive into things. So Akshay, welcome to the stream. How are you doing today? Thanks, John. Quite well. Hi, everybody. Awesome. So um, I know that you have a very diverse background. You've got some technical skills. You've got, um, you know, very business economics background, um, and you've worked in several different um, on several different continents. So with different cultures, uh, and I'm interested in your perspective on how um, blockchain kind of is is um, perceived by these cultures. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my sort of career paths have been meandering, not in not always by choice, but, uh, you know, I'm thankful for all the experiences I've had and uh, beneficial, you know, I'm, I'm better for them. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, I really got exposed to blockchain more when I moved to Canada a couple of years back. And uh, um, my experience uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the way it's perceived by different uh, cultures is most, you know, not necessarily firsthand accepted interactions with people, but from these cultures. Uh, but what I found is that there tends to be a, like a uh, you know a diver well not divergence but like uh, a diversity of sort of uh, use cases that that tend to resonate with different uh, with different cultures and um, in sort of uh, countries and er and areas where institutions are maybe you know maybe not as uh, established or where trust is not as uh, enshrined by intermediaries and institutions there tends to be more of a you know uh, blockchain and, and and crypto in particular is seen as a way to sort of circumvent this uh regularly this capture or this sort of uh repression that takes place uh you know by the central authorities of power whereas um while there is you know use cases for that in in, in countries like canada as well what i find here especially from the point of view of uh of investment and and, and fdi is that the use cases here tend to focus more on uh you know uh and trust is well, while the you know the ability of blockchain to sort of enshrine trust in code and circumvent intermediation is is important. Uh, I think the key values are still driven by the gains in efficiency, the gains in uh, you know the advantage of immutability uh, that blockchain brings. Awesome. We had um, a great talk just yesterday, um, and we were talking about behavioral economics and mm -hmm. um, how uh, to. Particularly in the West, we uh, have like a more individualistic kind of mentality, and it's it, generally speaking in the East. Also, there's a more communal um, kind of perspective of things, and how that plays a part in um, the applications that we're seeing come out through different technologies and how people tend to organize into groups. So I love um, I love that this is a yeah. I love how this is like a decentralized, a true decentralized movement, and um, we're all kind of coming together in a way, but bringing our own kind of flavors to um, to the to the field. Um, mm -hmm. Also, uh, what what so what was your kind of? You mentioned that you got introduced to blockchain what, coming to Canada. So, what was that kind of um, you know process like, and what was the aha moment where you're like, oh, I should probably learn a little bit more about this. Yeah, well, so the thing is, uh, well, my doctoral dissertation was on financial intermediaries, you know, which is kind of, in, in a way, you know, uh, 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 the, the structure that in some instances blockchain is looking to sort of obviate by code, replaced by code. So um, uh, I come to this, you know, from the point of view of an optimist, optimist but a skeptic in the sense that, you know, I, I need to be convinced that, that there is incentive compatibility in, 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 in the model that's being pushed, you know, in the value chain and the value proposition that's being advanced. So, uh, you know, I see uh, intermediaries as being beneficial in certain cases, but also, you know, subject to capture and sort of, you know, uh, 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 subject to being repressive when because they concentrate so much information and so much uh, power as it were. And so, uh, uh, you know, 
I, I do see promise in blockchain, but I'm you know I'm a little bit more skeptical than maybe the, the most you know the strongest crypto enthusiasts. But I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think I come from it from a different lens. That's all. Yeah, no, that's that's very important to also have a healthy level of skepticism. Um, yeah, and I think like the uh, the true um, blockchain enthusiasts are are, are very uh, big about like the disintermediation of of ecosystems but like you said there are instances where intermediaries do provide value and are still necessary so um can you think of anything i know i'm putting you on the spot but can you think of anything mm -hmm. where like definitely we need uh intermediaries like for example we were talking just yesterday about real estate agents and how we could probably run a lot of transactions like um uh, value transfer of like a house using blockchain, but will we still need real estate agents? Do they provide um, a thing? Can you think of any other kind of things? I mean, just in the, from a general theoretic, theoretical point of view, intermediaries tend to, you know, I mean, they do bring gains in efficiency. They do open up potential markets where because of uh, different uh, sort of uh, information sets as a word, that's an, again, a theoretical construct. But basically, if there's a lack of, uh, you know, uh, consistent information available. There's insider information on one side and on another side. Then intermediaries kind of tend to bridge that gap and allow for markets uh, to, to take place where traditionally in, in absence of intermediaries, they would break down. So I do see you know value and efficiency in facilitating uh, uh, sort of the connection of these markets with their own information sets. But at the same time, uh, you know, that also makes them prone to, you know, because they're in a position of power by facilitating this, facilitating this link, that also makes them prone to uh, potential abuses of power. So it, it's a fine balance, but uh, one that, you know, now that that uh, like the, the blockchain has a way around if for a while intermediaries were the only way to go to, to facilitate these kinds of transactions. But, uh, you know, blockchain with its uh, with its sort of advantages of being able to uh, uh, sort of encode trust, as it were, uh, can in some cases obviate intermediaries. So it just gives them more competition sometimes, which is, you know, which is always the better, better for the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, we had a poll during that that talk on like, um, mm -hmm. do you think the intermediaries will stay the exact same if we're going to get rid of them completely? Or are they just going to need to learn to code in some sort of way? And I'm, I think I'm in the middle path. I think if there is going to be uh, an intermediary in the in the future, they're going to be technologically savvy. They're going to be able to facilitate these transactions using their expertise, but they're going to be able to implement that through smart contracts and um, put the, putting more open, transparent, um, you know, application to the blockchain. So I think uh, it's a great, a great space that we're in. And um, I'm very, mm -hmm. very happy to have you here. Uh, one more question before we jump into things uh, like I know sure. you again, you have like a technological background and uh, uh, economy background. So do you have any advice for folks that are building businesses for this hackathon on like things to keep in mind for uh, a successful project as it were? Uh again i mean i think you know without trying to be too trite or you know too generic i think uh, again based on my interaction of people you know of people looking to invest in canada and looking you know uh the, what what they always look for is to make sure you know that that, that the value proposition is always entirely clear and that you know you know that you know you're solving a problem that needs to be solved you know you, you don't have to go trying to find a solution for a problem that doesn't exist just to use a new technology you know and like uh because People see through that, you know, fairly quickly. That you know, the, the hype train seems to have left already. So, you know, people, you won't just get money because you're doing a blockchain solution anymore. You you have to make sure that the value proposition is made apparent and and is one that you know th that can sort of sustain uh, repeated investigation. It's not just something that uh, it needs to be a, so a solid, concrete value proposition, basically. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, okay, so. For the folks that I see have trickled in here, I'd like to welcome you to the stream. We are about to jump in, but before I'd like to draw your attention quickly um, to the bottom of the screen, there is an ask a question button. So if at all during uh, the point, uh, at any point during Akshay's presentation, if you have any questions, please drop them down there. If you see a question that you really want answered, give that an upvote, and then we're going to go through them towards the end of the presentation. Um, right beside that, though, there is a poll uh, uh, button. So if you take a look at the polls there, uh, we've got a couple of questions. We want to know some info from you. And I see some folks have already um, dropped some answers. 
Um, so the first thing we want to know was, had you heard of ICTC before? And uh, we got a 50-50 split. Some people have been reading the reports for years, and some people, this is, uh, this is their first taste, and they're about to um, check out some of the amazing reports that I, I've seen come out of ICTC. So that's encouraging to see there. Uh, we'd like to know if you're a developer or if you're an entrepreneur. So um, uh, an, uh, an overwhelming amount of non-developers, but we have entrepreneurs in the crowd. 25% um, are, that are tuning in are devs. And um, I, I'm assuming that that, that same 25% are not yet entrepreneurs based on the numbers here. But we'll see. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to balance out through this hackathon. Is we're taking devs into the entrepreneurial path and we're taking entrepreneurs into the development path and we're meeting somewhere in the middle and building businesses um, in the process in a, a very new uh, industry. So without any further delay, um, I'd like to introduce um, Akshay. He is an economist and an engineer by training. He has spent the majority of his career applying his analytical and quantitative skill to uh, skill set to address complex questions in research, policy, and business settings. Having had the opportunity to work across four continents in corporate, industrial, academic, and entrepreneurial environments, Akshay brings a well-rounded perspective to analysis, as well as first-hand experience with cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural approaches to problem solving. So I'd like everybody to give a nice digital round of applause uh, for Akshay as he takes over the stream. Cheers, thanks, Sharon. Perfect, let me just share the slides. Looking good. Brilliant. Uh, excellent. Thanks again, Jaron, and good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshay Koshak, uh, and I'm a senior economist at the digital think tank of the Information and Communications Technology Council of Canada. Uh, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll get to what we are, uh, who we are and what we do uh, shortly. Um, today's talk is focused on key findings from research done by my colleagues and me uh, over the last couple of years, uh, studying Canada's blockchain ecosystem, its strengths and weaknesses, and its attractiveness for foreign investment in particular. Um, for starters, um, sorry. Uh, let me give you some quick information, you know, on ICTC, you know, because as, as uh, Joran mentioned, you know, there's, there's a fair few of you, you know, who may not have heard of us. Uh, um, so ICTC is an independent, uh, not-for-profit national center of expertise for strengthening um, Canada's digital advantage in a global economy. Uh, we were founded about uh, almost 30 years ago as a sector council, so part of the federal government then, focused on the then nascent uh, ICT, the Information and Communications Technology sector. For the last 10 or so years, uh, we've been an independent, not-for-profit organization uh, working on projects funded by the federal, uh, provincial, and municipal governments, and also with other entities such as uh, crown corporations, industry associations, uh, international organizations, and publicly traded technology companies. Uh, uh, with over 75 professionals located across the country, from Vancouver to uh, the Maritimes, uh, all the way to New, uh, to New Brunswick, uh, um, we conduct re uh, multidisciplinary research and provide um, evidence-based practical policy advice. Uh, but we, uh, we also provide over 25 tools, programs, and initiatives to support students, job seekers, uh, and new immigrants uh, uh, and businesses across Canada. Uh, we're a leader in innovative and inclusive capacity building programs for the dig digital economy. Uh, and we, uh, as of 2019, we reached almost 30,000 students and workers and across uh, 1,200 ICT businesses across Canada. Um, we facilitate partnerships with industry, academia, and government just to advance again with the with the objective of advancing Canada's digital economy. Um, the digital think tank, uh, which has recently been rebranded as so, is basically the policy and research arm of ICTC. We're a team of 23 researchers, uh, you know, economists, sociologists, political, social, and data scientists, uh, and we're located in six provinces from BC to Nova Scotia, and work with organizations all across the country. Uh, and also with the uh, with international organizations and those in the US and Europe. Uh, we conduct research to identify uh, and answer practical questions related to things like um, key technologies, the, the economics and social impact of key technologies, uh, education, skills and labor, uh, market trends and competition, um, data and security, trade and investment, other topics uh, relevant to the Canadian and global digital economy. Perfect. Um, uh, 
So over the last couple of years, uh, since sort of end 2018, the uh, digital think tank with funding from the federal government and from uh, a crown corporation has conducted in-depth studies on blockchain in Canada and published two major reports. Um, uh, the first, which was published in end 2019, was an in-depth look at Canada's blockchain ecosystem. So it was a survey of the, of the landscape here, basically. And it looked at the economic and labor market impacts of the technology since, uh, since its inception in Canada about a decade or so back, and outlined some key trends moving forward. Um, the second study was a follow-up, and that was published this summer. Uh, it focused in particular on Canada's attractiveness for foreign uh, investment related to blockchain. Um, it focused on sort of um, uh, in particular uh, in insights. Uh, sorry, insights from both reports form the basis of today's presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll have the links for them at the end of the presentation for you to download via QR code. Um, the analysis. Uh, Moving on to the methodology, the analysis of both studies uh, involved research from primary and secondary sources. So we conducted key informant interviews with a diverse group of Canadian and international uh, blockchain industry participants and stakeholders, um, diverse with regards to sort of geographical location, with regards to size and business maturity. So everything from, 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 from startups to you know, Fortune 500 companies and uh, with industry sectors and use case. Um, we also convened an advisory committee and, uh, and, uh, of experts, uh, about a dozen experts in the sector, uh, located in Canada from industry, academia, and from nonprofit industry organizations. And we hosted multiple meetings to, you know, to serve to sort of confirm the direction of research to corroborate key findings, uh, you know, along, along the intermediate stages of our research. And then to, to also, we also augmented our findings from these interviews and consultations with uh, our data team scraping the web for supplementary insights. So we looked at uh, company level, workforce level, uh, employment and education data, along with scraping online job boards to get a bit of a forward looking uh, insight on the demand for blockchain uh, jobs and skills. Uh, all data that is, just a few caveats, so all data that was scraped is publicly available and has been completely anonymized and used in aggregate. Um, Apart from our primary research, we were, we also supplemented this with secondary research uh, data source, uh, from from reports and articles that are published, uh, and also from analysis of data from public and proprietary data sources. Um, now, just a few caveats on the limitations. You know, while every effort was made to sort of mitigate biases and knowledge gap in these reports, uh, uh, uncertainty and sort of uh, in uh, and underestimation, or sort of uncertainty and estimation, is both so is, is inevitable with research on such a new technology. Uh, they, you know, existing data and research on blockchain are, are rather uh, scarce and preliminary uh, at the time. And due to the novelty and volatility and the complexity of, of this ecosystem, as well as limited data, there's bound to be an in inherent sort of high degree of uncertainty in the forecasts we make. Uh, and finally, uh, I think what, what sort of bears highlighting is that this analysis was done for both these reports was done prior to COVID. So, the current blockchain reality in Canada is bound to have changed, you know, in light of such a uh, sort of a seismic and massive uh, global and economic global economic shock. It is nonetheless still instructive to assess and understand that what the state of play has been in, in blockchain in Canada over the last few years leading, you know, prior to this uh, massive external shock. Um, we can, let's start, you know, by, by taking a look at the uh, block, a look at uh, Canada's blockchain ecosystem with a view to understanding um, the main industries in Canada that are working on blockchain-based products and solutions, and the various use cases within these industries. Uh, we'll also take a look at the various hubs of blockchain activity in terms of research centers, uh, innovation hubs, uh, you know, hubs for entrepreneurship and employment within Canada. Uh, we'll look at Canada's current blockchain workforce, sort of the skills and training they have, where they're based, where their talents are being sought in terms of where the blockchain jobs are. And finally, we'll look at you know some of the new and developing education and training resources available to uh, those keen on learning the technology in Canada. And we'll also you know once having assessed, having taken a, a lay of the land, we'll also uh, make some make some comments on uh, sort of assessing these trends through time and discuss why we're starting to you know why we feel that we're starting to see some maturity in the ecosystem here as it becomes more established. Um, uh, let's start with sort of taking a look at the sector composition, you know, as uh, it stood in 2019 when we last scraped data. So in Canada, many applications of blockchain, uh, particularly those outside of financial applications, are in proof of concept stage. And so 
uh, it's sort of which is kind of in line with global estimates, where only about a, a, a survey, a recent global survey, uh, found that only about a fifth, uh, eighteen percent or so of organizations uh, in Canada have, have sort of uh, uh, are, are in projects that are sort of in the life uh, in life phase. Most of them tend to be in, are currently in proof of concept or pilot phase. Um, uh, and so, sixty percent of um, blockchain firms in Canada offer, offer services related to cryptocurrencies, uh, finance, and financial services and fintech, and um, and also in blockchain consulting, which is sort of the idea of of helping other companies develop and produce uh, proofs of concept and pilots. Um, and uh, uh, the the snapshot was from the scraping of about uh, almost three hundred companies uh, in Canada that we did. And uh, we sort of categorized their business uh, model into these different categories. And we also had data on an additional 138 firms, uh, but we didn't include them because either their model was inscrutable or that they didn't have any identifiable, identifiable Canadian employees. Um, um, now, it stands to reason that, in, you know, given the fact that it's, uh, it's a market that's characterized by exploratory research, uh, you know, and early stage proofs of concept still, uh, that um, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest components uh, in terms of sector representation tends to be tend to be those where there is a bit more of an established and mature use case, and that's why we see uh, in sectors such as energy, um, uh, entertainment, uh, education. These ones, you know, th these these are still fairly small, and but but that, that's it. They are growing. Um, some of the most uh, common use cases in in crypto would be you know exchanges, uh, sort of software in terms of. Uh, uh, wallets, tokens, uh, and also um, mining and hardware companies. In the finance sector, you know, there's use cases ranging from cross-border transfers, uh, def uh, you know, uh, decentralized finance, digital assets and tokenization, loan syndication, you know, mobile peer-to-peer -peer payments, security settlement, loyalty rewards, um, and trade financing. And in the ICT sector, related industries, we have blockchain consulting, there's software services, sort of blockchain as a service. Uh, there's IT for retail and consumer trade. There's sort of digital ID and credentials, which is particularly important in Canada. There's data management and decentralized storage. Um, and some other important use cases that we've uh, seen uh, come, you know, from our interactions have been rights management and copyright protection, especially in the digital media industry. There's micropayments for con online content. Uh, there's provenance tracking and supply chain management across a whole ra uh, range of industries from sort of food to pharmaceuticals to automobile parts um there's uh, there's medical records and clinical trial data in the healthcare industry which is also being trialed on on, on you know in an anonymized blockchain uh, blockchain storage solution and there's tamper proof monitoring of hardware especially when connected with iot sensors and so on which is also being trialed in a lot of uh, uh, places um so this this figure sort of shows an evolution of the split of the blockchain sector through time, and uh, you know some of the important things uh, trends that jump out from this are that the growth rate kind of follows you know uh, the price of major cryptocurrencies, which in itself is a proxy for the popularity of Bitcoin. So we see a big surge you know in in the in the period from 2015 up to 2017, uh, and then a you know a slowdown since then. Uh, you know, uh, uh, following the crypto winter, basically. Uh, what we also see is that uh, in terms of the cryptocurrency sector, the, the, the growth was rapid between 2016 and 2017 uh, when there was a massive surge in the price uh, and popularity. Uh, but that said, since then, while the growth has slowed, there's been an increase in the diversity and the number of use cases and the breadth of sectors where blockchain solutions are being trialed. So that bodes well in that it is... Um, uh, you know, uh, it's becoming a, uh, the use of blockchain is becoming, uh, you know, is going beyond just cryptocurrencies, and there's an, a growing awareness of the benefits of the technology across a wider variety of sectors. Um, and you know that while there's been a slowdown in growth, I promise it it shows a bit more resilience in the fact that it's diversified. Um, in terms of regional ecosystems and uh, sort of the different across the different provinces in Canada. Um, Ontario, you know, has, has had a long history. Toronto, particularly, has had a long history uh, with with uh, blockchain. Given, you know, of course, with the sort of the, the genesis of, of Ethereum, you know, in, in a meetup, uh, you know, in the GTA, uh, 
it's a lot, a lot of our uh, consultations uh, sort of pointed to uh, Ontario in general being sort of a center of fintech experimentation, government involvement with blockchain, uh, uh, and a balance between sort of the decentralized public uh, uh, permissionless world uh, of Ethereum uh, and uh, 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 to the enterprise ecosystem of sort of cent of permission uh, pl uh, platforms like Hyperledger. Um, British Columbia is seen as an up and coming player. It's sort of you know the, the, there's, a, there's a there's a bigger diversity of projects and use cases there. Um, it's a hub. Uh, it's a hub that's uh, Vancouver in particular is seen as a hub for diverse projects, not limited to any particular industry or platform as such. Um, in terms of uh, in Quebec, uh, a lot of our uh, interviewees pointed to the history. You know, there's, they've had a bit of an up and down history with crypt, uh, with cryptocurrency, where there was uh, a initial encouragement and then subsequent bans and then reintroduction of uh, sort of energy sale to crypto miners. Uh, and so there's a bit of mistrust there, but a lot of our interviewers also commented that uh, sort of Quebec is Canada's stronghold for some of the sort of Bitcoin communities, uh, cypherpunk roots, uh, and it's sort of, they see it as a source for decentralized innovation in the future. Uh, amongst the up and comings, uh, you know, provinces, uh, Alberta, again, has seen a lot of growth and, and a strong unified uh, sort of uh, blockchain and crypto community in, uh, in Calgary and other centers, Edmonton. And they've also seen um, uh, strong use cases uh, interested in supply chain management and provenance tracking as well, you know, given its sort of uh, extractive heavy uh, industry mix uh, at present. Uh, finally, Nova Scotia's blockchain ecosystem is also, you know, another emergent uh, 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 sector that's you know, with, with a strong labor force. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the, the ecosystem in Halifax has begun to take a, you know, a, a clear place in the Canadian stage. A number of big players in fintech and P2P gambling and, and gaming are uh, headquartered in in the province. Um, also, so so this figure sort of plots uh, the blockchain uh, workforce uh, across Canada from 2015 to the last five years, and sort of naturally tied to business growth is the growth in labor force and the increasing existence of blockchain skilled workers. Uh, uh, while Ontario and British Columbia absorb the majority of blockchain workers, sort of smaller provinces are starting to see, uh, you know, starting to come come into their own. Uh, they're, they're scaling more rapidly, uh, and they're sort of starting to develop their own ability to attract blockchain workers uh, and and develop a skilled talent base. Uh, sort of Alberta tripled this volume of workers from you know from 2018 to 2019. Uh, Nova Scotia grew from you know basically a zero presence. Uh, in, in 2016 to you know a, a close to 100 strong community now uh, uh, based on our online scraping and uh, sort of in comparison obviously despite a much larger share in Ontario and British Columbia those markets are you know are, are seeing more, more modest growth which stands to reason given you know given the size um, with regards to uh, you know uh, another way to get a sense of sort of where growth is taking place is to look at sort of job postings in the recent past. So this figure sort of looks at uh, the total number of unique blockchain related job postings scraped from between end 2017 November through August 2019 when the when this uh, report was uh, was being finalized uh, and this was scraped from multiple online job boards uh, by our, both our data, data team and using external data sets uh, from labor market intelligence providers and most of these postings you know were still posted in Vancouver and Toronto. These two these cities are definitely the core of blockchain activity in Canada. Uh, that said, you know we do expect to see uh, these the trend to shift as emerging regional hubs grow, and of course as sort of the longer term labor market impacts uh, of COVID nineteen become more apparent. Um, the next figure is a snapshot of um, the Canadian blockchain workforce in end twenty nineteen. And just to give a sense of what the chart represents, the outer figures give you a sense of uh, you know the relative size of the workforce in various provinces. So you can clearly see that Ontario and British Columbia still form you know the bulk, close like more than two thirds of the workforce. Uh, but we see you know strong presence in Quebec, Alberta, Nova Scotia, and some other provinces as well. And, and the cords between them sort of represent the flow of workers through uh, between provinces and from their last uh, province of education. And what we see is uh, sort of the, the, you know, obviously this, while this is just a static picture, you know, in end 2019, it does highlight two very important trends uh, that are particularly useful to sort of to denote. Um, the first one is that there's a highly interconnected and mobile nature of the Canadian blockchain workforce. There's lots of flows across 
provinces, you know, people, uh, Ontario, there's obviously a lot of uh, university uh, and training programs in engineering and software in sort of Ontario, British Columbia, but there's a lot of flow amongst these provinces. Uh, it's a highly mobile workforce. And the second uh, uh, feature to note is the significant proportion of international workers. So, so, um, um, yeah. So there's uh, workers who have been educated, you know, educated in in the U.S., in the U.K., in India, in the EU, uh, uh, across uh, other BRIC countries as well. Um, and uh, so there's plenty of uh, high skill talent coming out of Canadian engineering and technical schools, uh, and they've sort of embraced and led this self starter and self dot uh, drive amongst blockchain pioneers. Um, there's lots of online and in-person resources for blockchain enthusiasts. There's meetups, there's MOOCs, there's online certifications, there's open source resources for learning and collaboration. Uh, but it does, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of, uh, of uh, sort of familiarity with, uh, with, tech, with technical uh, education and also obviously a lot of initiative and drive. Uh, but, further, but further to this, educational institutions in Canada are sort of starting to offer structured coursework and uh, sort of research programs in blockchain now as well. Institutions like George Brown, uh, York University, UBC, Ryerson, and so on. We'll get to them uh, a little further down the presentation. So I look at, uh, sort of looking at the, the growth and composition of Canada's bl blockchain workforce over the last five years. Uh, so this one, this figure is, is, is sort of uh, a split by the kinds of roles uh, associated with blockchain uh, as opposed to the provinces. And what we're seeing here, uh, again, of course, there's been a sheer, you know, a sheer increase in size is, you know, of the blockchain workforce has gone from, uh, it's gone, it's got had a 15 fold increase over the last five years, which is, you know, which is mighty impressive. But also another noteworthy trend, which is again heartening for its longer term prospects is a shift towards, uh, towards more technical roles. I mean, uh, while the audience today, I believe, is, is more entrepreneurs, what we're also seeing is that uh, there's been an establishment of, uh, you know, of specialist roles as well. So uh, from 2015 to 2019, uh, the proportion of founders in the blockchain labor force has gone down from 22 to 14 uh, percent, and developers have grown as a percentage every year from rising from 3 to 11 percent. So what we're seeing is that um, uh, th th there's a move away from generalists and 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 sort of uh, and starters into more specialized roles, which promise, which sort of show signs for maturity, right? So um, um, obviously, the, there's a bit of uncertainty as to how these trends have shifted in 2019, but these initial findings would suggest that there's been a that there's been a sense of maturity in the industry where sort of uh, uh, generalist entrepreneurs are being replaced by more specialist roles, which uh, which points to mature uh, established teams where there is sort of specialization taking place. Um, Perfect. Right. Uh, so, uh, in our consultations with blockchain leaders from across the world, uh, you know, we looked at sort of we looked at themes on the blockchain industry in terms of the outlook and perceptions of blockchain industry in general, as well as the relative attractiveness uh, of Canada as a destination for blockchain investment. And uh, a few key themes have emerged from our discussions, which we'll sort of go over sequentially. Uh, probably one of the most common challenges that were faced by uh, a lot of our interviews was that um, there's there's still very much this misconception this misconception held by many of the of their clients customers and the public at large that sort of blockchain is synonymous with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, uh, and this is obviously you know uh, particularly uh, uh, problematic in the aftermath of, of, of sort of the the crisis uh, in 2018 with, with the blockchain sort of uh, uh, price uh, with the Bitcoin price crash sorry. Um, so there's been some apprehension since that, and you know, since the failures of a few ICOs. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, you know, as as we all know, uh, sort of the applications of blockchain go far beyond just cryptocurrencies. And there's a need for uh, a broader understanding of the of the value proposition of blockchain. You know, beyond just sort of disentangling uh, blockchain from other cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think uh, a lot of what a lot of our interviews pointed out was that there's this is a key ob obstacle for broader technology uh, sort of uh, adoption. Uh, because it, it keeps, you know, a lot of businesses and, you know, a lot of SMEs because, you know, seeing as SMEs for, you know, over 90% of, of, of the business base in Canada, there's uh, a lot of businesses are just too skeptical and always, you know, they sort of shut down, shut down when they hear blockchain because there's this association with Bitcoin, which has been in the news uh, sometimes for not the, not the right reasons. Uh, and so that keeps, uh, that keeps uh, the public from appreciating its sort of unique uh, properties and value propositions. Uh, 
Um, in terms of some of the most important current key value drivers uh, for for near term blockchain solutions that are being trialed uh, 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 in the enterprise setting in, in particular, it's sort of the reduction of overhead costs that the increase in efficiency, transparency, and auditability brings uh, with blockchain. So examples include uh, sort of digitizing transaction records on shared distributed ledgers uh, and tokenizing asset ownership. Uh, allows for much faster settlements in the finance industry and reduce sort of carry costs or interest costs for this. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, while simultaneously reducing the potential for sort of fraud and money laundering, uh, uh, and these efficiencies uh, sort of you know reduce overhead costs significantly for the, the, the multi you know trillion dollar uh, financial services industry globally. Um, efficiency then generated by digitizing and consolidating ID records can lead to sort of uh, Lower, lower customer wait times at service and at service call centers, and a higher throughput, which again leads to a significant reduction in overhead costs. Another example lies in sort of the fact that blockchain is tamper evident. Uh, blockchain solutions can be made tamper evident, and this promise, you know, this promises to prevent sort of uh, financial and reputational waste because of fraud in sort of black and gray market, uh, in black and gray market for parts in. Sort of the supply chains for everything from pharmaceuticals to automobiles to um, food production to con and a host of consumer goods, um, and a lot of this sort of uh, this can be facilitated by you know the fact that we have a distributed network of data and greater visibility along value chains uh, would allow for sort of new and improved product service offerings, uh, Especially in conjunction with advanced technologies like AI and IoT, which is where again a lot of the promise of uh, uh, of blockchain lies. Um, the third big sort of uh, talking point that came from our discussions with our uh, uh, with uh, blockchain experts was this idea that the current sort of uh, a lot of the current enterprise settings uh, are in the private permission flavor. And to sidestep issues of scalability and to sort of follow, allow for tighter control of data on the blockchain, which becomes quite important in, in certain heavily regulated industries. Uh, but even in these closed networks, sort of true, the true efficiency, true economies of scale can really be realized uh, only when multiple competitors in an industry or sector come together to form, you know, uh, to form this cooperative, like a, a, a sort of non competitive uh, technology layer, which everyone can sort of take advantage of. And you know this this sort of because it requires a fairly heavy investment of capital and setting of set standards within industries. It needs large scale cooperation at the industry level, and this uh, you know again has been uh, is not the easiest dynamic to initiate. Uh, again, and that's what has been sort of you know our experts have said that so there's a need for industry players to come together and set up standards and governance structures uh, in consortia and make collective investments that will lay down the rails for this sort of non competitive technology layer. But um, uh, you know, it, it's not always conducive to sort of bring about this uh, incentive structure, which again sort of points to, uh, uh, and th and this dynamic is one that would need to be resolved. Uh, you know, if we were to truly unleash the power of blockchain and and get it to mass adoption and and and, and mass use. Um, a further external impediment uh, to the scaling up of blockchain solutions uh, from sort of from pilots to full blown production. Is sort of regulatory and legal uncertainty, and this isn't you know this isn't a reference just to crypto or digital assets. Uh, in heavily regulated industries such as conventional financial services and healthcare, until sort of larger questions of regulation are resolved, the return on investment on blockchain products, uh, blockchain solutions, uh, is too uncertain to allow for any sort of meaning meaningful large scale capex. Um, uh, 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 on the flip side, also younger companies, you know, especially uh, you know, on the flip side of the regulation argument, younger companies, especially those in knowledge-intensive sectors with sort of few fixed assets, uh, uh, you know, are also prone to innovation flight if sort of uh, and move to jurisdictions with more consistent and innovation-friendly regulations and growth incentives. Uh, one final forward-looking theme that emerged from our uh, this consultations was the need for cross-disciplinary talent, sort of talent that's working, comfortable working at the intersection of technology and business. Um, a lot of uh, the, the, the current blockchain uh, entrepreneurs are self-starters self, self -starters and, um, uh, you know, ha have sort of amassed uh, 
experiences, uh, uh, you know, have amassed sort of blockchain knowledge combined with their previous experiences to provide uh, value offerings. Um, if blockchain is to become sort of the foundational technology that uh, that is champion seed being, uh, it'll it'll sort of bring about a whole new set of business models rather than just disrupting existing ones. Uh, and so the uh, while the current blockchain solutions that are you know, like those that are aimed at sort of unlocking value through uh, gains and efficiency or waste reduction, you know, while they bring about uh, an added value, added value, they're, they're kind of like they're low hanging fruit. So uh, the real sort of, uh, well, it's, it's not quite a done deal, but like the real fundamental rethink of existing value offerings is, uh, will, is what will really drive sort of blockchain forward. And, uh, sort of uncovering these new propositions and these novel revenue streams and sort of reimagining entire value chains, uh, especially when combined with uh, AI and IoT, will require sort of a blend of technical knowledge of this foundational technology, but also sort of business knowledge in the various industry sectors uh, to sort of reimagine, you know, what, what revenue streams would be given uh, the, the sort of the potential uh, uh, potential benefits that blockchain can unlock and so this kind of foundational change is very dependent on uh multidisciplinary talent that is comfortable working at, uh, on both the technical and business fronts um what we also sort of you know uh discussed engage from our consultations uh was to get a sense of you know where canada's relative strengths and weaknesses lay in terms of uh uh, of, of, of both its blockchain ecosystem and its ability to attract foreign investment. Um, on the strength side, you know, can, uh, the Canada's key strengths relate to sort of its human capital, its innovation hubs and intellectual property, and its sort of championing of a global diverse workforce, uh, high skilled workforce. So uh, its single biggest strength in blockchain is its pool of skilled talent and its strong academic and research institutions. Um, there's, there's vibrant research labs with a growing number of blockchain research projects in you know, universities across the country, from Waterloo, uh, York, Rice, and all the way to UBC, Dalhousie, you know, on, on the East Coast as well. Um, and there's more formal courses that are coming into place. You know, uh, I mean, I think the George, the George Brown College example is, is, is you know, it's given as a is one of the earliest examples. But there's more that are coming in place now that are forming more structured uh, sort of programs to those seeking to learn more about blockchain. Um, Canada is also home to strategic initiatives uh, from, from the center promoting innovation and technology as a key driver of future growth. So and the government has this ambitious super clusters initiative, which is bringing sort of synergistic benefits to strengthening tech hubs across Canada. Um, and additionally, blockchain hubs in Canada have, a, have very strong sort of, uh, have seen the emergence of very strong, uh, lively and engaged communities that bring together technologists, entrepreneurs, academics. So the, 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 there's a very strong meetup community in, block, in Toronto. Uh, with over, you know, I think the blockchain hub has over 4,000 members that meet regularly to sort of raise awareness uh, and sort of discuss, you know, ideate uh, on uh, hackathons like this, for uh, like the current one, for example, are great resources for entrepreneurs and developers to, you know, to ideate and have discussions on technology, on business models, on use cases, on sort of crypto, crypto economics and incentives, and sort of network and learn. And uh, Entrepreneurs in sort of, you know, apart from the established communities in Ontario and BC, there's also vibrant hubs emerging in, in Quebec, in Alberta, in, in Nova Scotia. And so Canada, in that sense, you know, uh, the, the, the perception across the world is that Canada punches well above its weight in the blockchain ecosystem and is well represented. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is that given, you know, as with other knowledge intensive and innovation heavy sectors that rely on high skilled workers, uh, Canada's blockchain ecosystem will stand to benefit from its commitment to diversity and globalism. Uh, you know, Canada holds a strong appeal for skilled workers from around the world because of its vibrant economy, its strong institutions, its sort of good quality of life and sort of a broad uh, support for, for immigration. Uh, and Canada's skilled labor migration systems were again raised in our discussions uh, as being one of the most sort of the longest standing and most elaborate in OECD countries and uh, sort of, you know, a role model for sort of uh, for, for successful migration management. Um, over 60 percent of Canada's foreign born population um, is highly educated, which ranks it uh, at the top of the OECD countries. So. Uh, uh, one of the advantages of this system is that it's sort of it's responsive and data driven. So 
the express entry program for instance can you know has a has a sophisticated and customizable selection mechanism which allows Canada to attract high skilled workers in target sectors and fill gaps in the labor supply um on the flip side some of the red, red flags uh, in Canada's uh, sort of relative attractiveness for blockchain FDI was uh, regulatory uncertainty now uh, this is obviously a problem that's not unique to Canada uh, and it sort of hinders significant, you know, as we, I discussed, it, it hinders investment in sort of large, enter, uh, uh, large enterprise scale investment in a lot of industries. Uh, but um, uh, it's definitely an, an, you know, an issue uh, uh, that, that Canada also faces. And there's been some encouraging developments of late. There's, you know, there's a regulatory sandbox that's, uh, that the Ontario Securities Commission and the, the Canadian Securities Administrators uh, have sort of uh, put in place to allow firms to obtain sort of exempted relief uh, from securities laws to to test um, uh, their use cases and their and, and their services uh, uh, to a large audience in a real time basis. But um, there's still a need for more clarity on this front. There's still need for uh, 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 a, a more established uh, regulatory frame, framework for blockchain based solutions. Um, and you know, despite some of these uh, in the steps shown by financial regulators, for instance, in Canada, there is still a wider perception that uh, Canada's regulatory regime is sort of uh, you know a bit slow to react and unresponsive. And that, uh, especially when combined with Canada's general overall sort of uh, position on the OECD's FDI regulatory index, uh, it, it, it is probably one of the, uh, the fourth most restrictive country, especially in the ICT sector. Uh, you know that acts as an impediment to uh, the attractiveness for foreign investment. Um, our experts pointed to sort of other jurisdictions, both large and small, taking a more proactive stance uh, in shaping clear blockchain strategies at the national and sectoral level. And so, uh, you know, the, the clear regulatory frameworks and they, it enables innovation, attracts investments, it spurs greater adoption. And so uh, that's a, a big hurdle that, that, that needs to be uh, overcome. A second issue raised, uh, particularly you know, by businesses uh, that have presence both uh, across Canada and internationally, uh, sort of contrasted the risk-taking culture in Canada's tech industry with that in the US. And I mean, it's an issue that's often leveled against the Canadian tech sector, and uh, it's sort of unfair to you know to brand Canadians as or the Canadian tech sector as risk-averse because Canada outpaces uh, a lot of its OECD peer its OECD peers in terms of entrepreneurial ambition. So. In terms of new firm creation, in terms of uh, public sector R and D spend, in terms of the research output of its universities, uh, and the ease of starting a business, um, Canada, you know, is far it does far better than uh, most of its OECD peers. But I think the issue that's sort of uh, the, at the heart of this is the scale up phase. Uh, so a lot of Canadian companies face challenges in sort of securing uh, access to capital in strategic procure procurement contracts, and uh, there, there tends to be a uh, a lack of uh, uh, of sort of the, uh, or an ina inadequate supply of sort of uh, quality scale up CEOs sort of uh, um, and so uh, to this front actually I think uh, ICDC just recently published uh, a uh, a white paper you know with some policy proposals on how uh, we can sort of you know work on creating a more inclusive and resilient sort of scale up ecosystem for the tech sector in Canada. Um, Finally, um, in terms of uh, some of the opportunities that, uh, you know, given these broad strategic themes that we uncovered and given um, um, <clears throat> the relative strengths and advantages of Canada's uh, ecosystem, there's a few key opportunities that we think would be, you know, useful to grasp. Uh, and the overarching theme here is to sort of avoid, avoid complacency and resting on uh, can its laurels and on its relative strength, uh, while also looking to mitigate weaknesses. So. Uh, uh, you know, while Canadian institutes have started offering blockchain certifications and technical courses, uh, there's a need to sort of maybe increase the the breadth of of uh, uh, disciplines covered in these, you know, and expand their scope beyond just sort of technical aspects. The real uh, the real value propositions of blockchain that uh, involve you know uh, reimagining traditional uh, business models and revenue streams, and sort of uh, getting a bigger cl clarity on regulatory and legal fronts so expanding the curriculum beyond just the technical aspects to legal aspects to business cases the business aspects would help spur broader debate on these issues but also cultivating a blockchain workforce that gets a deeper understanding and a broader understanding of the technology and its uses um 
greater public discourse on blockchain would also serve to sort of you know reignite public interest and again sort of help uh, dispel these common myths that conflate uh, blockchain with cryptocurrency. Um, another useful uh, experience that Canada can rely on is his experiences with establishing a world-class ecosystem in the artificial intelligence and machine learning arena. So uh, Canada's AI ML uh, sort of ecosystem, which has you know been loaded as world beating, has been an, uh, a very fruitful public-private sort of uh, partnership that has incorporated government funding, uh, venture capital, uh, university initiatives, and also private sector partnerships. And uh, while it is fair to say that a lot of this, you know, has been focused on IP generation and uh, and sort of research, there is now signs that you know all that IP generation has is now bearing fruit and moving into commercialization and sort of. Uh, so uh, real business case development. And so, uh, so you know, examples of this, like um, startups like Element AI and uh, Borealis AI and Layer 6, which are sort of incubators or research centers housed within businesses uh, are producing some, you know, cutting edge uh, work with uh, uh, with real business, a uh, real world business applicability and adoption in place. Um, and so, so funding for these uh, these uh, innovative research institutes in AI was part of a forward-looking pan-Canadian AI strategy designed to sort of spur R&D and attract and retain top talent and sort of catalyze private sector investment. And a similarly forward-looking approach and a coherent national approach for blockchain uh, development, you know, would, would definitely help it propel help propel it to a global uh, leadership stage. Um, these measures also tend to work, strengthen blockchain hubs in Canada, which also again serve as a, a catalyst for foreign investment. Uh, because again, research, recent research has shown that uh, a vast majority of global investors tend to look at regional ecosystems more than uh, you know when making FDI decisions. So as long as certain basic criteria of stability, political and economic stability are met, uh, investment decisions tend to be based on regional ecosystems and sort of uh, creating these uh, hubs of, uh, of of research and innovation would tend to you know act as a natural magnet or natural sink for foreign investment and this effect this effect appears to be particularly strong in even stronger in the Americas and in the IT sector so uh, and th this trend has sort of been growing over the last few years um, the appeal here becomes you know the large urban hubs attract uh, top talent and this is like a powerful cycle with innovation hubs uh with good talent good talent attracting more capital which then further attracts more talent and it's like a virtuous cycle um that being said you know some of the the other important decisions uh also remain tax incentives and innovation capabilities uh and in this regard uh, a recent study from uh, ictc on uh on CETA and uh, the additional fdi opportunities for canada was quite in, in, informative because a large majority of of, of sort of uh, businesses and uh, technology companies in Europe uh, were unaware of major you know FDI incentive programs uh, or the Innovation Superclusters Initiative, for example. So there's also an opportunity to sort of you know uh, uh, re, um, sort of re-emphasize ca Canada's strategic, strategic pivot towards uh, technology and innovative technology as a key driver for growth going forward. And, it's, and, and, and of its wider tech community and its blockchain ecosystem in particular. Um, finally, on the threat side, you know, uh, the cultivation of a modern, uh, diverse, global, internationally mobile workforce cuts both ways. You know, well, you know Canada is looking to benefit from its pool of high-skilled multinational workers, but it also, you know, uh, it also must strive to ensure that it's creating a welcoming environment for innovation and investment to retain this high-skilled workforce. You know, while you want to be attractive to uh, people with high skill and high ability uh you know uh, you, you also have to make sure that you you know you, that, that 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 attractiveness is is sustained and so this is you know one of the key threats that was highlighted uh in our discussions uh experts recognize that you know when people want to learn uh, um when people uh, when there's insufficient resources to learn about blockchain canada people tend to move to uh larger ecosystems in particular in the us and uh, you know, we found that a recent study found that about a, a percent of Canada's talent leaves for the U.S. every year. You know, with Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley being the top destination for the uh, for those. Uh, and uh, you know, while compensation is one of the chief reasons, there's also this. Uh, uh, the other reason tends to be the sm uh, relatively smaller ecosystem in Canada, and so the lack of like, uh, sev like like lack of top brands here, and so brand recognition becomes another motivating factor, especially for sort of. Uh, younger you know new recent grads uh, and a lot of the sort of the the top brands tend to be in the us so that tends to lead to drain uh, another threat you know as discussed earlier was 
the idea of sort of innovation drain, which is to do with um, uh, potentially uh, um, a reduction, in, uh, the unavailability of, 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 of R&D or, or funding and of the sort of problems faced with scaling up, uh, you know, in medium size uh, and small and medium sized companies. Um, for blockchain specifically, uh, regulation also plays an important role. So regulatory uncertainty, you know, is always going to be an, uh, uh, an issue. And especially given that large funding hubs are located in the US, Europe and Asia, and there's tax friendly regimes in Switzerland and Singapore and other countries sort of, uh, you know, that, that pro also provides a risk, um, poses a risk of Canadian entrepreneurs re relocating to more innovative, innovation conducive uh, sort of regimes. Uh, and obviously, you know, while sort of crafting a tax regulation and incentives for uh, entrepreneurs, you know, is a nuanced and uh, involved exercise. Uh, this is, you know, an area that Canada definitely you know, needs to step its game up in. And some useful steps in this direction would be to uh, increase sort of public private blockchain, uh, you know, pilot projects like Project Jasper, which was done by the Bank of Canada and Payments Canada, uh, digital ID projects that have been undertaken by the, the provincial governments of Ontario and British Columbia. Uh, also to be more proactive in the use of sort of flexible policy tools such as developing standards um, for blockchain and distributed ledgers in general and to sort of foster multilater multilateral and international cooperation and in blockchain regulation. Um, so finally, just to wrap up, let me just conclude by sort of uh, putting together some of the key points um, uh, that, that were raised across both our studies, you know. Uh, as with any emerging technology, you know, blockchain has gone through its own iteration of the hype cycle. You know, it's gone from the peak of cryptomania in end 2017 to the to the subsequent sort of trough of disillusionment of crypto winter, and you know, uh, it's now so you know we're, we're looking to see it emerge into the you know the so-called plateau of productivity. But there is still you know significant apprehension uh, uh, given given the conflation of uh, blockchain with cryptocurrencies and you know the the spate of IC, you know, ICO failures and setbacks like Quadriga for example and um, so there's a there's wide confusion of uh, with crypto even though blockchain has a, a lot more use cases and uh, uh, you know and as viable use cases are being trialed and pushed into production uh, in enterprise settings across a wide range of sectors um, uh, the, uh, so, so so some of the most use, most common use cases have been you know as we discussed uh, you know focused on the efficiency the transparency and the accountability that blockchain solutions provide uh, however the true economies of scale uh, are only expected to arise when sort of uh, multiple competitors form a non competitive layer in a consortium uh, uh, another roadblock as we you know as we've uh, repeatedly mentioned is sort of uh, regulatory and legal uncertainty especially in highly regulated industries like healthcare and uh, financial services, you know, where uh, the uncertainty adds to uncertainty in ROI, which sort of acts as an impediment to significant capex. Um, in terms of Canada's blockchain ecosystem, it's seen tremendous growth since its beginnings, you know, about a decade ago. And it's, it's got vibrant sort of, you know, global uh, hubs uh, in Vancouver and Toronto, and there's new ones emerging in Quebec, Alberta and Nova Scotia. Um, Canada punches above its weight in the global blockchain community, and it's sort of respected for its human capital, its innovation hubs, its intellectual property, and its championing of a global, diverse, uh, highly skilled workforce. Uh, other sort of you know innate characteristics that are advantages are like its high quality of life, stable uh, economic and social systems, uh, and Canada's strategic initiatives to promote uh, technology innovation as a key driver of economic growth. Uh, and its favorable skilled immigration policies also make it an attractive destination for FDI in general. Uh, uh, while on the flip side, you know, there's there's challenges related to sort of regulation and scale up and risk aversion in the tech sector, which tend to dampen FDI prospects. Um, I guess in summary, you know, as an open economy in a global system, you know, it's always going to face threats of innovation flight uh, and and talent flight to other jurisdictions. But uh, you know what we think is by sort of furthering its competitive advantage and human and intellectual capital generation, uh, Canada can create a uh, vibrant ecosystem that att attracts and retains uh, skill talent and, and and draws in private sector investment, while also sort of cultivating a deeper and broader understanding of the of blockchain technology uh, and its key value propositions. Excellent. Thanks again for your time today, everybody. Uh, before I sort of open the floor up for any questions, I just uh, wanted to share uh, both the links to the reports discussed in our presentations today.
the first one's a survey of the Canadian ecosystem, uh, and the second one's a report focused on the SDI and blockchain in Canada. Uh, the QR codes, you know, if you, you, should, you should be able to scan both the QR codes uh, either on your phone's QR, uh, the phone's OS QR code reader, or through your browser, and you should be you should be forwarded to the re respective reports. I mean, feel free to shoot me an email. You know, should should you uh, be unable to get to those pages for any reason, I'll be happy to sort of email you the links to the reports. Thanks again for your time, everyone. Amazing. Uh, I I copy and pasted one of the links there just in case folks have any issues. Oh, I wanted to, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna post the uh, second one in just a second uh, for folks in Thanks, case John. they didn't get a chance to capture that. Uh, no, thank you, Akshay. That was uh, very well informing. Um, it's always it's always good to have data to back our assumptions, of course. Um, and that's something I really like about ICTC. They, they're always researching, putting out reports, backed by data, um, and so that's that's fantastic. I think it's particularly important, you know, given a lot of what we look at are fairly new technologies, right? So it's not like StatScan has an elaborate database of this industry out there already, you know, be it, um, uh, you know, be it, blockchain, be it additive manufacturing, be it, uh, you know, uh, augmented and virtual reality. So a lot of what we do is to, you know, to, to sort of blend qualitative and quantitative sources. So we're, you know, we, we speak with um, uh, stakeholders ac you know, across the country, you know, uh, uh, with the broad sample of stakeholders, but also try and supplement sort of, you know, what is ultimately going to be a fairly small sample, you know, we can't go and speak with, you know, everyone out there, but then we try and supplement that that with sort of, you know, web scrape data to try and make uh, broader, more, you know, more informed general trends, uh, prognostications, I guess. As well. Yeah, um, that's, that's amazing. I know we're getting close to 12. I, I, I think you, you might need to, to jet. Do you have time for any questions? Um, I'm happy to stay for for five minutes. So I'm, I'm sorry, to, I it took longer than I than I thought. Yeah, no, I no, it was. Thing, but I'm, yeah, I, I'll be happy to stay for, for for five minutes, but then I will have to leave, unfortunately. Okay, I I, I will sneak a quick one in personally um, sure. for myself. Um, so, like you you talked about how Canada is in the forefront of you know global blockchain technology. Who's our competition? Did your research show like who like who are we competing with the most right now? So um, it, it, it's sort of you know I think there's there's different relative strengths for different countries. So you know the, I think uh, in the area of sort of of sort of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and crypto innovation, you know some of the OECD peers that we tend to be you know contrasted with and uh, tend to be like, like Switzerland is, a, is is an example that's known for its you know they've rebranded a whole area as Crypto Valley and so they you know they've allowed for general very generous incentive structures. Uh, they've made for mass adoption of sort of blockchain based solutions. There's sort of crypto ATMs and stuff in, in a lot of places in, in Europe. Um, uh, there's there's places in Asia, you know, in Singapore, uh, where again, there's the generous tax incentive structures that allow for innovation in these areas. Uh, and of course, you know, the, you're always going to have to compete with the US market just, you know, for, for its sheer size for and for the sheer both for the, the demand for the for the products and the supply of talent that they have to go with. So, I mean, there's, the US definitely has momentum on its side on these areas, but um, I think uh, where, you know, where, where Canada can sort of uh, come to its own, especially you know, is it's uh, one of the advantages that it has is this out, outwards open stance that it has, especially in a time when a lot of economies are becoming inward facing and more protectionist. So, uh, you know, it, it's affected its ability to sort of to uh, attract and champion what is, you know, like blockchain is a very international global sort of community. It's a very international uh, uh, set of, uh, of, of actors. And so I think that tends to, you know, that will help it stand in good stead um, if it continues to sort of push a strong intellectual property and it's able to sort of supp augment, supplement that with, uh, you know, a strong business ecosystem that helps uh, these ideas, you know, really commercialize and you know, take flight. Then, you know, that is uh, that's that's a recipe for you know for for, for sustained uh, re resilient success. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's several questions here um, mm -hmm. around some some things that I think you've touched on, like um, uh, the things that Canada is really strong at, and how we can uh, continue to set ourselves apart. 
um, and and also echoing um, what you kind of just ended off there with, like we're really strong with R and D, um, but the commercialization side of things is something that we we need to work on a little bit more. Um, there's mm -hmm. one question here um, regarding: Are you connected in any way to I N E T, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking? Are you familiar with this? I'm aware of them. The well, I. I I was aware of them during my graduate uh, studies in the UK. So uh, we uh, we are not affiliated with INET as such, uh, but I mean I, I've read some of their research. I mean they're also a very diverse uh, you know uh, group with 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 a, with a very broad research agenda. But but there's no affiliation between our organisations per se. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't want I don't want to go too deeply into all these questions because I think you did cover um, uh, most of them. Um, yeah, what sets us apart in terms of Canadian talent and and then some more some more comments. So um, I won't tie you up any longer. I want to really I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Well, I thank everyone for, you know, for, for, for their time and for their presence. And uh, again, you know, if I have if there's something I have to do, I'm, you know, I've got the email there. You know, I, I could just put it down here as well. Uh, mm. I'm, I'm available. People, you know, can feel free to shoot me an email if they want to discuss anything further. I'm more than happy to put it on here. I'm more than happy to discuss uh, at length that's amazing thank you so much so for for those of you that still have questions reach out to akshay and send him an email uh this was a really illuminating chat um i really you appreciated you you tuning in let's take a quick look at the polls that we had here um we had 76 or 67 percent of folks have been reading uh, ictc reports for years and 33 percent just found out about you guys and now are going to subscribe to your reports uh, we had an overwhelming um, audience filled of entrepreneurs that have not yet dumped into the development space, but that is what we are um, addressing through this hackathon. We're bringing some folks, um, entrepreneurs and developers together to create businesses. So on that note, if you haven't already signed up for BlockHack, please visit blockhack.ca, get, uh, get your application in, and I will see you over in the Discord where we can continue the conversation and support you as you build your business. And I want to thank you again, Akshay, for uh, being with us today and having that amazing presentation. And I hope to have you back on uh, later on, uh, maybe during the hackathon in our next hackathons that we have. Um, so Absolutely. thank you very much. Thanks again, Joe. And thanks, everyone. Keep up the good work and all the very best. Awesome. All right, folks, um, that is the only workshop we have for today, but make sure that you're tuning in in two days on Wednesday. We are back at it, and we have another packed uh, week for you guys uh, in terms of workshops and talks. So until then, I'll see you in the Discord, and I will see you in the next workshop. Take care, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye.